Hey everyone, Wes here. In this video, I'm excited to kick off a brand new series on design patterns in C-sharp, in which I'll be implementing all of the design patterns in the famous Gang of Four Design Patterns book in C-sharp. So this book has been around for quite some time now. I think the original version was published in 1994, and it really remains the de facto technical reference on design patterns. And although some of the examples in the book are a little bit dated in the sense that uh, the languages used are Smalltalk and C++, and the examples are generally for uh, things like graphical user interfaces, for kind of obscure systems, uh, things that might not resonate with, say, web developers in 2021. Uh, the cool thing about this book is that the underlying patterns, the patterns that are covered and the types of problems that they solve, are universal. And it's really a testament to how good these guys were, the authors, um, to recognize sort of the fundamental types of problems that occur in object-oriented software and to be able to catalog the types of ways that people have learned to solve them. And so it was a lot of fun diving into this book again, and it's been a lot of fun creating the repo, for which you can find a link in the description uh, for all of the examples in .NET. So one of the reasons I wanted to make this series was I found it pretty difficult to learn design patterns on on my own if I'm just looking around on the internet. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one, a lot of times the examples given are not really practical examples of real world problems, or at least not presented in that type of context. So I've tried to address that with the code that we'll be covering in this series by giving examples for food-based businesses and incorporating the types of dependencies that you don't often see in examples. So things like database dependencies, uh, AMQPQs, things like email services and loggers, uh, sort of the, the pieces of software that almost always come into play in complex systems and then kind of see how they, at least uh, sometimes peripherally, but nonetheless how they get incorporated into the types of objects that we'll be working with as we complete these design patterns. The other reason that I wanted to make this series was that if you look around um, on YouTube and elsewhere on the web, you'll find examples of people talking about design patterns and quite frankly giving them incorrect names or describing certain patterns um, and then not really talking about how they're implemented or perhaps even just misunderstanding uh, what certain design patterns are and then presenting that. Um, so I think that's a little unfortunate. Of course, language does change over time and there may be different names uh, for things that I'm not aware of, but I wanted to stick as, uh, as well as possible to the names of the patterns um, as presented in the Gang of Four book and then kind of bring more modern examples uh, to the code in demonstrating them. So in this video, I just want to talk at a high level about what design patterns are and why it might be useful for you as a software developer to gain a better understanding of them in general. So I think of design patterns as really just codified ways of solving common types of problems that occur in object-oriented software. And what that means is that they're independent of language and they're independent of uh, context in the sense of like business domain, for instance. Um, there are problems that are going to occur if you use object-oriented languages, and in particular, you use them uh, without thinking about how the software you write is going to change. So really the core motivation of many of these patterns is making software easier to change. Um, as we design systems, we should be thinking about the ways in which they are likely to change over time. Now, of course, we can't predict the future, um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to understand um, just from a practical level what's going to change as we, as we develop new features, as we want to extend our software, um, and what types of decisions can we make so that as our software changes, um, it's as painless as possible for us to implement. And so design patterns really address the types of problems that we run into at that level. Um, and 
I should mention, and the authors mentioned this as well, that design patterns aren't something that you learn and then you go looking for problems to solve with them. Uh, they are ways to solve particular types of problems and they always come at some cost. Every decision that we make about design has trade-offs. And as we go through the examples, one video per pattern in this series, we'll be talking about the types of trade-offs that are involved with the different patterns that we want to implement. Um, so when we talk about introducing some indirection to our code or breaking things into smaller objects so that we can reduce their uh, individual responsibilities. The decisions that we make are always going to come at some cost and often uh, some amount of increased complexity. And as good software developers, it's really up to us to try to understand what the benefit is for the cost that we pay, uh, often in the form of uh, indirection or, as I said, making smaller objects and things that are going to happen when we implement patterns. So if you've ever worked with uh, spaghetti code where you have just dependencies upon dependencies and uh, data flowing in multiple directions, maybe you have worked with so-called God classes which contain thousands of lines of code, are incredibly procedural and everyone's afraid to change because they control the most important logic in our software. If you've ever worked in these types of situations, then you know that software can um, basically get worse as it gets older. And uh, one of the things, one of the reasons that happens is because, well, one of the reasons it happens is because often we're under some type of time pressure, right? Like we just need to get something working and then we tell ourselves we'll go back and clean it up later and inevit inevitably that never happens. Um, and then um, other people come in and work on the code and introduce their own uh, style and naming conventions and paradigms. And just generally things get messier over time. Um, so how do we avoid that? Well, one of the ways that we avoid that is by trying to anticipate those types of things happening before our software gets to that point. Um, in another video series, maybe we'll talk about refactoring and working in legacy code and how we can improve existing software. But design patterns are really about the decisions that we make up front about how we intend for our software to grow as we extend its functionality. So for that reason alone, just being able to write software that's easier to work on um, as it changes is reason enough to at least understand uh, the different design patterns and the types of problems that they address. Um, the second part to that, of course, is also um, learning through experience what the cost of introducing the patterns is. And so we're not just running out and looking for problems to solve with particular design patterns. Okay, so the authors of this text break up design patterns into three main categories. We have creational patterns, which are concerned with the ways that we create new objects to work with. Structural patterns, which are concerned with the ways that we compose objects together to create the types of structures uh, that might be easy to change and solve problems over time. And then behavioral patterns, which are concerned with the ways that uh, the objects that we create collaborate. And so um, each of these three categories also have sort of subcategories of the types of problems that they solve. So in this series, we'll be looking at all of the patterns in each of those categories. Uh, we won't be going step by step through each category, but rather I'd like to cover some of the most important and really easy to implement patterns first, just to get a feeling for um, the general concept of things like using composition over inheritance and, uh, and programming to an interface. I'm really excited for this series. I hope you enjoy it. I've definitely learned a lot by doing a deeper dive into the text, and I hope that this series can serve as um, an example, a good example of implementation of these patterns. So it's definitely been a lot of fun diving back into this text and doing a real kind of deep dive on it and getting a better understanding of each of the patterns. I hope that this series is valuable for you as a developer or as an architect, and I would really appreciate it if you enjoy the series and get something out of it to like and subscribe. And in the next video, we'll be diving into our first pattern together. With that, I hope you're doing well, and I'll see you next time.